Hi, and welcome to another episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. On today's show, I am talking with a person who, like myself, does diary comics. So comics that are just kind of like about personal life. They don't, they're not gag comics. We actually talk about that and about how sometimes I'll get messages from people going, I don't get it. And it's like, there's nothing to get. There's no gag. This is a diary. It's a it's a means to find a way to write and draw, and uh, which is fine. I mean, of course, people think comics are gags. That's okay. But we talk about making those comics. But the person I talk to is actually a writer. The person has written for the AV Club uh, and also does a blog where they and a newsletter, an art an art newsletter where they talk about um, subjects like uh, the concepts behind some of the comic book storylines or the impact that they have culturally. It's it's fascinating stuff. It was really cool to talk to the person about this. But the other thing too is they just released a book of poetry. The, and, and when I say a book of poetry released it, I'm talking about in stores through a publisher. We talk about how they found a publisher to put the book out. And uh, it's actually a publisher here in the Midwest. So anyway, we talk about all these kind of things. It's an artist, a writer, and it's a great interview. So here is the podcast starting right now. Hi, my name is Tiffany Babb. Um, I'm a cultural critic and I do diary comics. Um, I write comedy sometimes. Uh, pretty much any kind of writing there is, I, I try to do a bit of it. Okay. It, how did you get started in writing? Like, why Why did you write? I guess I'm not a writer. I've always, writing is the thing that I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. I need a story for this thing I'm making. And then I try to write and I'm like, I should learn how to write. How did you <laughs> decide to Good get question. into writing? I think I, I read a lot as a kid, but yeah. then by the time I was in college, I was like, you know, I'm not going to be a writer. It's not very practical. Um, but I, my part-time job was at a publishing company. <laughs> so okay. I ended up spending time with writers all the time and like even though I was stud studying literature which I was like oh I'll, I'll use it for something serious I don't know what kind of job I thought I'd get out of that <laughs> but I was like you know it's, it makes more sense than being a writer and then just being around writers all the time I was like well you know what if they're doing it why can't I try it a bit yeah and so I started out kind of in cultural criticism which is still my main kind of boat what is that um, exactly uh, so like it's writing in response to things like in response to films comics is like my main gig okay. so i write a lot of comics criticism um kind of usually long longer form essays diving deep into what this comic is doing so uh, how it fits into cultural context kind of like not not like reviews of the latest comics but reviews of things about comics or storylines or arcs or things like that yeah Okay. More like that. I did do reviews for Bit for the AV Club last year, which was really fun just to be in a team of reviewers. Yeah. Um, but most of my stuff is like I'm trying to think. Oh, so um, I write for Panel by Panel Magazine, which is an online magazine mm -hmm. edited by uh, Hassan Osman El Hau. And next month is Catwoman, um, oh. the the Lonely City one, and the Club oh, Chain okay. book, which is great, by the way. Yeah. Um, and so my piece is on what it means to have an aging superhero and how this story isn't quite like the other old man stories that we've seen before. Yeah. Um, and what does it mean? Like, what does it mean when um, all of a sudden your knees aren't as good when you're jumping off buildings, right? What does that mean for this kind of story? I also saw that you did a story about the just one more thing, the Columbo. I, I was fascinated by that. <laughs> yeah. you, you wrote about the whole Columbo's walking out and you think he's done and, oh, just yeah. one more thing. And I thought that was great. I love old TV too. So, but it's comics as well. Uh, it, so how did you start doing comics reviews? I read comic strips as a kid, but I only got into comic books like in college. Really? I re yes. So fairly late for something that's okay. like 90% of what I do. What What made you decide to get into that? I suppose. Um, someone was like, oh, you should read this book. And I was like, okay, sure. And then I was like, oh, this is really interesting. Which one I, was it's it? It's funny. Um, so it was right around the time of Marvel now. So I, it was Hawkeye, the Fraction Aha Hawkeye. Okay. Um, and I mean, right around that time, I'd read Mouse as well. And I'd read Fun Home. Um, mm -hmm. And it was funny because I was going to write my honors thesis on Shakespeare and like gender. It's like okay. women in Shakespeare, queerness in Shakespeare. This is going to be really interesting. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, no, I have to do comics. <laughs> like, this is really interesting. There's cool <laughs> stuff happening. Um, so I like I, I can be a little obsessive. So I 
like read nothing but comics for like years. Okay. And I started blogging, um, not for very long. I'd like blogged and then I used my blog to pitch to women write about comics. Mm -hmm. And then from there I had a column for a little bit. And then, you know, now I had links that I could send people to pitch them articles and then just building things from there. This is fascinating. I love the fact that (laughs) that's the projection that it went into in the comics center, mainly just because I'm a huge comic book fan. So Mm -hmm. listening to you talk about it, I'm like, yeah, you did this, Um, (laughs) you know? (laughs) So how did you, uh, so you pitched to women who write about comics and uh, Mm -hmm. how how long has that been around? I think they just said their 10 year anniversary. I I, I saw it on Twitter, some big anniversary, which is really incredible for what they do because all of it's unpaid. Um, the writers are not paid. The editors aren't paid. It's really just this huge website. All the donations go to just running the thing. Mm-hmm. And it publishes all of these writers. Some of them have been around for a long time. Some of them are new. Some of them, it's their first byline, like it was for me, my first byline in, in comics criticism. So like, it's really useful and instrumental for people who are building their writing skills um, and people who just want to continue to write in that sphere. Yeah. Um, just because it provides editorial advice and it helps you. Um, and the website, what they do some really, really great work. And they they kind of, because they're so big and they publish so much, I think they provide so many different perspectives into comics. Mm-hmm. It's not just formalist, like, let's look at panel by panel. But they do that, too. It's also, well, let's look at, like, this through a trans lens. Or let's look at this from an Asian American lens. Or let's look at this um, just through the statistics of how much money it made. Like they do Mm -hmm. a lot of interesting stuff. And I think like them being around has made comics criticism much more rich in content type. Yeah. And I noticed that from, I found out about it because I was, uh, I had started following you and looking at some of the things that you had done and the links that you had posted. And I had found that. And I, I looked at a lot of the site and it's, it's a fascinating site. It's, it's really uh, got a lot of good stuff on there. I enjoyed it very much. Um, and you also said that you started working for, uh, the AV club and and then, so was this also part of the, you were now that you were writing these cultural reviews and blogging about it, you were sending these links and you pitched to them and they had you write for them or how did that happen? Um, I think someone somewhere had mentioned they were looking for people and then, an editor I'd worked with had mentioned my name, okay. which was very nice because that means I didn't have to look for the job. <laughs> and it was really fun because the AV club is such a different scope yeah. than anywhere. It's just bigger. It's mm-hmm. so much bigger than anywhere else I've written. Um, and while that can be dangerous sometimes, I had a I had a nice time. I didn't get any death threats or anything. <laughs> okay, good. Some people have. Really? Um, which is te- oh, yeah. Oh, it's, wow. It's terrifying what being a woman in comics <laughs> um kind of brings out of the woodwork i feel like there are a lot of like harassers online um there are a lot of really just terrible people who are like i mean they're stalkers and stuff i mean you hear this a lot from like women critics i've been very lucky i think my tastes and the places i've published have led me away from a lot of that but a lot of my colleagues who work for other publications or who cover let's say the Batman beat where there are a lot of people with a lot of opinions who don't want to listen to someone's opinion yes. and will attack you and try to get you fired from your job or something. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. It's quite terrifying. I'm um, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. Horrible. Luckily I I've been able to so far avoid a lot of that. And I think part of it is just the places I write are really kind of amazing places. Um, and yes, yeah, so I've, I've been lucky. Okay. Do you work online or do you go into a place? I guess I didn't think to no, ask where I, you're located. Yeah. I I'm, in, I'm in SoCal. Okay. I'm about half an hour out of downtown LA. Um, I moved back with my family during the pandemic. So that's been fun and interesting. Okay. <laughs> um, it's good to spend more time with my family, but it's kind of like, oh, it's really strange to be an adult living with your mom and grandmother. Yeah. Um, but, but it's been good, partially because like I was worried with, I mean, even now, like, I don't want to move away. I was living in New York. I don't want to move far away when I'm not 100% sure if it's going to be safe to travel back and forth. Mm-hmm. Um, so so I've been in SoCal, which in my hometown, which is pretty, it, it's not a terrible town. I, I do like it as right. suburbs go. Yeah. And your um, weather, of course. I'm up here in yes, Wisconsin. <laughs> Although we've been having, I mean, we don't have Wisconsin weather, <laughs> but we did have like a record rain. Um, oh, really? Yeah. Just a couple of weeks ago. It was kind of wild. Like we had a tree that like 
most of like it has like multiple trunks and like almost all the trunks just like fell to the ground really <laughs> because of like the wind and rain yeah it's it's been quite rainy over here okay. um, these past couple weeks all right i'll forgive but... you for the warm weather then <laughs> you're getting so, something at least um, i know right and, and and there's snow on the mountains which is nice I'm, I'm excited to go up and look at it i don't ski oh. or anything but i like to at least see the snow once right here. you're you're a skiing observer <laughs> yes right <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I mostly work remote pretty much. I, I write for a lot of different publications. I'm not a staff writer anywhere. Okay. Um, so everything's online. You pitch editors, they say yes or no, you work on your piece and you mail, you email it in, um, you know, 21st century stuff, I guess. Yeah. Um, is but, this something, is this what you do full time? Uh, no, I do that part time. And then I teach, um, undergraduate students um, oh, okay. at a local university as well. Okay. And you've also, during this time, you were with writing articles for other places and doing, you know, uh, the, well, the articles. I, I don't know why I thought I was adding more to that. Uh, you also uh, have been, you released a book recently. Yes. Oh, gosh. I, you know, I keep forgetting that it happened because it all just the happened. Stuff, <laughs> it just happened last week. Um, it's funny, too, because today we're going to drive um, down to Skylight Books okay. over um, in LA because it's on the shelves there. And it's like the first, store that has it on the shelf so i'm excited to go take pictures um but a list of things i've lost it's uh, my first collection of poetry published by vegetarian alcoholic press um and also in the midwest mm -hmm. and yeah so that's quite exciting um i've been working on it for a couple of years um i had a i got my mfa in 2020 and that's when i graduated during the pandemic and i'd actually started that program as a poetry student <clears throat> i ended up transferring out to study writing for children and young adults but but I've been working on poetry for for quite a few years now, um, so it's exciting to have a book. Yeah, is this the first book you've put out? Uh yeah, it's my first book, like of any sort. All so right. so it is cool, and it's just kind of surreal um, because it's like okay, you write a book, you've put a lot of work into it. Yeah, someone says yes, we're going to publish it, and then it's like radio silence for a really long time <laughs> and it's just like you like well i guess this book's coming i should probably try to get it placed places or do some press maybe i don't know there's not much press for poetry right yeah um, it's not a huge market surprise surprise okay um and then all of a sudden it's out and you're like oh i should call my like local barnes and noble and tell them to carry it and they they are going to carry it which is exciting also um but like just trying to like place it now and it's like now it's a physical thing that I can hold and people are reading mm -hmm. and like emailing me saying that they liked it. And I'm like, this is very strange because for so long it's just, I'm, I tend, because I write for online, like I tend to get feedback really quickly. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, I write an article, it's out next month. People like it or they don't, whatever, moving on. Mm -hmm. Or at least I get editor feedback, but this was like worked on it for two years. You know, nobody really read it other than like my editors or like, mentors and then all of a sudden like people are reading it and it's like but i wrote this like two years ago uh-huh <laughs> it's very strange well and the other thing too is it's different than uh it, you, you make a good point and it just put an idea in my head where i'm like yeah it's not like you just posted a picture or like a po a picture yeah. you know a poem online and then was like okay we'll see if people like it this week it didn't get much traction i'll write another one no this is a exactly. book this is a book where it's like I have to continue. It's still there. <laughs> I yeah. have to make sure that Can't people still it. know it's there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is. Oh, wow. It is strange um, for sure. All right, and I've I've had a lot of people on the show who have said that they're looking for publishers. How did you find the publisher and actually get your book published? Well, <clears throat> just by submitting. Um, so I think in poetry, there's like a bit of a rule of thumb that you should have like a third to half of the poems in your manuscript already published. Okay. So I try to publish poetry pretty regularly. Um, I'm not as good about it now, but over the past few years, I try to send out two, three submissions a week. Mm -hmm. um, and so you end up with about 100 rejections a year and maybe five or six poems published. Nice That's, little collection. Okay. Yeah. You know how things go. Um, it can be soul crushing, but oh. once you, I think once you hit your first 100 rejections, it's no longer soul crushing. Like you just really quickly just, you're just like, you know what? This is just, the way of life now. Okay. So I just um, need to get up to a hundred rejections and then I'll be yeah. okay with it. Okay. Exactly. Good. That's some good advice. Yeah, then they are, they're, they just become background noise. They're okay. part of the process. And I think as any kind of professional artist, it's really important to build that up and to realize that rejection is part of the process. 
um, I was speaking to a very famous poet a couple of years ago and he like poems of the New Yorker kind of famous. And he was like, oh yeah, I was working on a poem that got rejected by this magazine. And I was like, who would reject you? Like you are <laughs> the person, right? You are the famous poet. Yeah. And then I realized like, this is just like, even when you're famous, maybe your rejections, you have fewer ones, but they're still there. And it's always going to be there because art is, that's how like art gets into the world. Usually there's, I mean, we have like Instagram now where we can post our stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but if we're doing some sort of mainstream publishing route or if we're trying to get paid for it, there will always be people saying no. And that's not a reflection on, it's never a reflection on you, first of all. Always important to separate yourself from your work. Um, it's never a reflection on you, but it's just, there are a million different reasons. Maybe one of the reasons is it's not good and mm -hmm. that's fine. Yeah. And like sometimes you make bad work. Like it's really interesting moving back from New York. I We hired movers because I left New York fairly early and I had a subletter. Um, so I kept my apartment for several months with a subletter in there. And then I hired movers to ship all my stuff back. And I didn't really have access to it until last month. Really? Um, wow. Yeah, from March 2020 to last month. And opening like the the boxes, I found these paintings that I was working on. And it was so, like, it was a series of paintings. And it took me like five minutes to determine like which ones were actually good and which ones were actually terrible. <laughs> okay. And like at the time, I probably thought they were all equally good because that's how our brains were just like, you know, it's at least that's how I'm not overly critical about my work. <laughs> I'm just like, this is good enough. Let's put it on Twitter. And then like three weeks later, I'm like, oh, I can't believe I put that on Twitter. Oh, yeah. Um, but like about half the paintings were like ready to go into the trash. And I feel like for me, I'm like, well, you know what? Even if I did show it to people, it's fine. Like mm -hmm. sometimes you make bad work. And like that's also part of being an artist. Like you have to. I think for me, learning to to hopefully build a really long, I guess now I've been working maybe five or six years in, in the arts in some capacity or another writing and, and that sort of thing. But I think building up the understanding that rejection is constant. Your work is like, your your best work is not going to be 100% of the time. That's impossible. Mm -hmm. Nobody's best work right. is 100% of the time. Sometimes you're going to make stuff you're really proud of. Sometimes like, you're not. And sometimes you're going to look at your old stuff 10 years later and be like, I don't know how I did that. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Like I couldn't do that now. And that's just because like life, like we're long, we live long, complicated lives. <laughs> yeah. of lots of like different aspects. And like, no, I think when I speak to people starting out, or if I spoke to me at like 19 or something, like there's so much pressure to say like, this is me. This is all of me in my book or this yeah. is all of me in these three paintings and it's like no it isn't because <laughs> the paintings are here and you're still walking around like, right you're still living your life um you are you your paintings are what you did with this period of your time mm -hmm. um, and i think having that distance is so important um to not getting burnt out or not like feeling traumatized every time someone says no to you mm-hmm Another thing too, I realized uh, when you were saying you put one uh, online going because, you know, even if it's bad or you find out later that it's bad. The other thing too is sometimes those are the ones people like and they'll go, I really yeah. like this one. And you'll be like, what? <laughs> I it's hate so that true. one. And then you have to live with it because it's actually resonating with people. And it's like, that's the point, even though it's weird yeah. for, you know, yourself to look at it. But yeah, yeah we have no... Um, it's funny because like as artists, I feel like we think we have so much control over our work. <laughs> it's like we're doing it, right? <laughs> right? But like once it's out there, we are not. And mm -hmm. like we don't we don't know how people are gonna react. It's funny um that you mentioned the the like sometimes it's your bad work or what you consider your bad work that people resonate with. Mm -hmm. An early diary comic. So I am quite I'm not lazy. I am very impatient. So I wasn't using like rulers or stencils for my first like 20 diary comics. Oh, I was yeah. just like kind of looks like a square mm -hmm. and one of the earliest ones i'm i feel like i must have been doing it on the back of like a truck going down a dirt road <laughs> like the panel borders are like at wild like 30 degree angles and um it's literally one that people refer to the most when they're talking to me um oh really my friend made me a christmas present she carved me a little stamp mm -hmm. from one of those crooked very crooked slanted it's like the idea of a parallelogram. That's the panel. Okay. And like she did that. Um, she sent me that as a Christmas gift, which is very sweet. And I love it. <laughs> but I was like, 
it looks terrible. Like I, <laughs> every time I see it, I think I want to redraw it, but I'm also like, you know, it's fine. I, I don't want to redraw it. Right. Um, but it is wild that people like that's one that people resonate with. Like that it blows my mind. Um, but you're right. Sometimes that, and like, we can't, we can't tell people how to feel. Well, right? and that goes into, yeah. And I mean, writing about comics too, and like the, the idea of comics that you do and also going into web comics, there's the whole theory of there are different sort of methodologies of things that people use in comics to make them seem more like not using a panel makes it seem like it's mm-hmm. more exposed or open or, and, and maybe that doing that made it seem like it was really, really personal or, you know, like <laughs> it's one of those things where psychologically, we don't know why it triggered, but it did. Mm-hmm. And it made yeah. people go, I really like that one. It seems so sincere or it seems so, you know, uh, really personal. And that might be it exactly with yeah. you saying, it looks like you're drawing it this way. I have a couple that I've done where uh, I, so a lot of them in the beginning were very personal because the first year that I did the comic was about me and my wife going when she uh, was diagnosed with breast cancer and we were going through that. And I, I just basically drew about it. And sometimes I just didn't have the tablet that I was using. (laughs) So I would draw it on like a napkin or a piece of paper and I would draw the square and it was all very, and then I'd take a picture of it and import it, you know? And I've Mm -hmm. seen that you've done that on a few of the earlier ones that you had too. You've taken, used a picture. And uh, they were all very shaky. And then I realized whenever I did those ones, and this was very accidental, it was always one of the ones where it was like something really difficult was going on that day. So it looked like I was just like, I couldn't even hold the pen still. It was unintentional, but it's, maybe it wasn't. I don't know. Anyway, I don't know why I brought that up. Um, so <laughs> it, it adds a different, it, I think, I, I get why you brought it up because it it adds something that is not tangible in our minds as an artist. Like we're not necessarily planning for it, but like the, the actual artifact of it reflects your real life. Yeah. Yeah. And like you didn't have time to sit down with your tablet that day. And so you did not And that shows that to your reader. It's true. And I also was very, in the beginning, I was very adamant about making sure that I drew every day, even if like it was just, I didn't have time or something I would find. And Mm -hmm. and that's why I eventually, my comics, I only spend 15 minutes doing the personal web comic, the diary web comic. Cause otherwise I turned it into like, a comic strip or something, you know, otherwise it's going to be just like, it's not, it's, it's going to be me writing about stories or trying to think of something. It's like, that's not what it's supposed to be. It's just supposed to be me finding something every day that happened because I've talked to people because I keep a, I keep a diary. I found out um, a long time ago that I could snooze messages to myself and myself in Gmail. So Hmm. I would write an email, send it to myself And then I would snooze it in the top for a year later and then it would turn it on a year later and then I would reply to that message. And I've been doing it for several years and I've told people about it, but they're like, I wouldn't have enough to write about. And I'm like, no, something happens every day, even if it's small, like there's something to remember about each day. And that's, that was one of the things I wanted to do about that comic. So, and that goes into, I wanted to ask you, you kind of started your comic um, in 2020, right? Or were you Uh, doing it before that? Yeah. So how, Um, why did you start the web comic? So it's interesting because I, so I, I do art. I do like, I watercolor, I paint a bit. Um, and I, I work in charcoal, but I've asked someone who writes about comics and also writes comics. Sometimes the first question people ask you is, Oh, do you draw your own comics? And I've always (laughs) been like, no, no. Sequential art's a whole different thing, which it is. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, um, uh, what happened a few years ago? Um, I met at the Eisner's Brian Canini. Um, who does this great um, newspaper. Also, I like um, how you just like grazed by that you were at the Eisner's. You were at the Eisner's? Oh, yeah, well, panel by panel won the, um, that that was the year we won. We were nominated twice. Okay. And that was the panel by panel won um, best uh, journalism periodical. Um, and wow. my editor who lives in England <laughs> could not be there. Okay. I was there. So it was really fun. Um, so I got to go get the statue. Um and it, it was, it was, it was really, it was really exciting. And it was yeah. like, just really incredible because I think the magazine does a lot of amazing work. It publishes some really incredible writing um, that is only like a tiny percentage me, but I'm like, I'm involved, right? Of course. Um, so, so we were up against this great um, newspaper called the Columbus Scribbler that Brian Canini, I think co-publishes um, with another artist. And it's all like Ohio based cartoonists. Okay. Um, and so I met Brian and then, um, a year later we, I was in Michigan speaking at a, at a, um, academic conference at their, um, comics forum. 
Um, and he was selling his diary comics. I was like, oh yeah, sure. Looks great. Mm -hmm. I was reading his diary comics and I think I'd read diary comics before, but like not necessarily by anyone I knew. Right. (laughs) And I'm like, oh, I know this guy. Like he's cool. Um, and then in 2020, believe the believer, the magazine was doing these like Friday afternoon, um, free workshops. Okay. And they had a couple diary comic ones. And I was like, I was like showing up to them because like this is fun to like do something with your Friday afternoon. And I was like, well, I guess I can do this too. Like, why not? Like, mm-hmm. like I, I didn't want to do anything too complicated. I didn't, I, I think you're right. Like, I, I think I spent about half an hour doing, doing a comic a week because I, I was like, I don't want to do anything too complicated. It's something that I won't stress about, but yeah. I do want to do it. Also, um, there's I no think- money in it. <laughs> also, there's no money in it. Also true. Um, but like, I thought it would be like a fun way to just like do something like focus on art. I, I don't always work on art all that much, especially now because I'm super busy mm-hmm. um, with writing and teaching. Um, but I was like, this is a way that I'm making sure I'm making something new every week. Yes. Um, and it's really interesting because it's so different from, first of all, like almost nobody in my life reads any of my writing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they don't care about my thoughts about Tick, Tick, Boom. <laughs> like that is just not in their wheelhouse. Yeah. And then I, I do a newsletter that's every month and some people read that. Um, but what people really read are the diary comics. Yeah. Um, because it scrolls by their Facebook or their Instagram or their Twitter. And they're mm-hmm. like, oh, that's what you're up to. And it'll be funny because people will be like, oh, I know you into the pumpkin patch last week. Like, <laughs> right. How do you know that? <laughs> um, and or you only had really, one uh, avocado grow. <laughs> yes. It's, it's really funny. It's one of those things where it's just like, oh, they're like, people are reading this and they're responding to it and they're remembering it. Mm-hmm. And it's really special because I actually do feel like, um, I have like a like it's helped me keep in touch with more people mm-hmm. in my life, like friends and stuff. Because they'll be like, "Oh, this happened." They'll be like, "Oh, it's interesting this happened to you." And then we'll be like, "Oh yeah, let's catch up on the phone sometime this week." Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know how many strangers read it. <laughs> um, although to be fair, um, I, I post on I started posting on Reddit maybe around like number forty or something. Okay, and. I, I got onto the front page um, oh. of the webcomic section on my, I did a vaccine. It was just like a little thing like, oh, got a vaccine, felt really sick. Yeah. But I'm like, okay now. And like, it got so many, like, like it, people liked it. And then it got so many like anti-vaxxer comments yeah. that like they froze the whole post. They took it down. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I was like, nothing in this is controversial. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, like no. it was like maybe the tamest thing I've ever, like it, nothing happens. It's just, I got a shot. But it's the fact you were talking about it and the opinionated people came out and said. Yeah. And they were just like spamming, they were spamming every comment pretty much wow. just saying, don't you know you're going to die? And it was just like, <laughs> wow. um, so that was a weird day. Cause like, because I don't get a lot of like hits on Reddit, I don't mute my notifications. Cause I get mm-hmm. like three a week usually. Right. And then like my whole email was just like, all of this happening real time. And then like all of these like people saying you're going to die or like, don't you understand? They're like killing our children. And then like all of a sudden nothing. Cause right. they just the whole thing. That's pretty exciting yeah. though. I mean, that's, it uh, was and you never know what kind of traffic you got from that. I mean, clearly yeah. the people who are angry when they can't say why they're angry anymore, they're not going to like continue to follow you. It's yeah. not like you're out there posting more like this, but the yeah. people who did like it, um, would follow you because they're like, oh, they probably checked out some of your other stuff and got what was going on that you were writing yeah. about yourself. And fo- like, did you have an uptick in uh, followers or anything after that? I don't, I had a, a very small uptick, but I think what helped was I got like, are they called kudos? Yeah. And that bumps your, that bumps your posts up when oh, you're wow. posting. I think. Okay. I, I don't 100%, I, this may be complete bullshit. Yeah. I don't 100% understand about it, but I think that's how it works. Cause once someone, we were promoting a Kickstarter I was in and someone was like, does anyone with like more than a thousand kudos, like, can someone post this? So I was like, oh yeah. And I was like, I didn't know that was a thing. Um, but I, I guess it is. Yeah. Yeah. There's some people have more power than others. And uh, it's, I'm always hit or miss with Reddit. Like I really dig it when I go there sometimes, but I'm mm-hmm. always like, 
I'm always super, it, it's like a, a high school gym locker yes. or a gym room or something. <laughs> it's just cool. like, am I going to do something where everybody's just going to like be a jerk to me or whatever? I don't yeah. know why that involves uh, high school in general is that way. Um, so, it's, but that's the way I always, I just fear like somebody's going to do something if I do something there. And sometimes I'll post and I will get, I'll get some people who say something nice. I've had a couple of people defend me, but mainly it's just people would go, this isn't funny. And I'm like, that's not what this is. That is very, I know. I've gotten that comment before too. It's, it's like very not annoying. all web comics are like, dun, 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 dun boop. Yes. You know, it's it's like, where's the joke? And I'm yeah. like, there's no joke. Right. And so a lot of people don't get that. And then especially mm -hmm. I realize too, it's just like, oh, for like what you were saying, people know about your life and follow you on Instagram and everything. If they follow you, they get what's going on. If it's a yeah. one-off and people are scrolling for web comics on like Imgur or, Reb or Reddit, uh, mm -hmm. they they're looking for jokes and like yeah, it's like yeah. they don't know my background. Sure. Now they got to research me, you know, ask them to do work. <laughs> yeah, I mean these on online spaces. I feel like it really like there are some Reddits that are just so sweet and like yeah, and you can tell like they're very much. heavily moderated. Like yeah. the moderators are like on it, and there's some places that are like the Wild West. <laughs> Yeah, And it's like just knowing, like knowing the risks of where you're going. I mean, on like the funny thing is um, a couple of years ago, I was, uh, I'm a big Stephen Sondheim fan, the composer who who recently died. Um, and I was in this big Stephen Sondheim group and like people were just, I just couldn't handle it anymore because people were just mean to each other, like full on, mm. like someone ask a normal question someone would be like i can't believe you don't know this how can you call yourself a fan <laughs> i mean it was like it was but it's like all like 80 year olds yeah like it's not like teenagers okay and so it really was like, the get off my lawn sort of thing oh yeah <laughs> it was and it was like the cam the camel that broke the straw the straw that broke the camel's back was like they were doing a free concert online for steven sondheim's 90th birthday mm -hmm. and like they had technical difficulties and it was late and all you saw was people like complaining. <laughs> like, I can't believe they're, and I'm like, this is a free concert that people are doing. And it's online. On. It's not like you have to beat the traffic yeah, home. <laughs> exactly. And I was like, you all need to chill. And then, and then I just started my own group. And I was like, people are not allowed to be mean in this group. <laughs> like, we have rules. Like, like you can't be like homophobic or transphobic or racist or anything. Mm -hmm. Like, there's like those rules. But other than that, it's just like, just be nice. Yeah. <laughs> like, there's no room. Like, why, like, there's some places, if I'm with my friends, I'm going to be sarcastic and mean, sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when you're online sharing a space with strangers and you're all there because you like something, there's no reason to be sarcastic on everybody else's posts. Yeah. <laughs> like, we don't need your, like, haha, like, didn't you know, like, you misheard that and that should actually say this instead of that? Oh, you're so stupid. It's like, mm -hmm. no. Like, just, this is not what I'm here for. Let's just be kind. <laughs> Um, and I think like the, the internet, like when you find those little spaces and like now that I have this little space, which is now actually really big, it's like, I mean, not really big. It's like five, 600 people. Oh, wow. But like, um, like bigger than I thought it, I thought it'd be like a hundred people. Mm -hmm. Um, the other groups, like several thousand, but I was, but like, once you find these smaller spaces where you can interact with people, where you can post your own work and people aren't being assholes about it right. for no reason. Yeah. Um, it's funny you mentioned um, there's not a lot of crossover, um, which I, I think is true. But I remember um, when I was in, at the AV Club, we did a somewhat controversial end of year list okay. where like there were no big super. I think there's like two superhero books on it. It wasn't like 99 percent superhero books and people were kind of mad about it. Um, I think I kind of like, remember that me, list because it was comics. it was like the more graphic novel books than yeah. than superhero. Yeah. Yeah, and I put like a very indie indie book there, and people are like, nobody's reading these books. I'm like, well, don't like this is our year end list. Yeah, <laughs> this is not like an aggregate. And I remember because I'd just gotten a tablet, which I never use, um, and I was like playing with it, and then I posted like something I I drew, like something simple, like in my diary comic style, and like some stranger rando was like you bought a tablet and this is like all you can do. <laughs> and it was like maybe the day after the AV club thing came out, I was like, Oh, this person came from there. And okay. like pissed. Yeah. Um, Cause I never like people that follow me on Twitter are perfectly polite. I like, I very rarely run into like issues. Um, and well, I was like, and also oh, you, you drew it and posted there. it and go, isn't that neat? I just, you, you're just kind of going like, Oh, I did a thing. And you're not going, I made this, you yeah. know? <laughs> exactly. And it was like, it was, 
literally just like a like scribbling of me like oh I've got a tablet mm-hmm. and like it was really just one of those things where it's just like I'm glad I'm not on the that I don't spend time on the parts of the internet where this is common because <laughs> <laughs> that would just I don't know how people do it. It's exhausting. Yeah. No, I I did for a while and I even did it with the uh, intent of kind of messing with people who did that sort of stuff. (laughs) And Uh even that was just like, oh my God, I did this so many times already. I don't want to do it again. So I just stopped doing it. It's one of those things where like, even when you fight back, it's kind of like, do I want to put the time and effort just to like have this right. one person go, boy, he got me because they're totally going to do that. They're totally going to be like, yeah. well, zing on me. No, they're not at all. Yeah. <laughs> What's the point? <laughs> yeah. It, and then uh, uh, the other thing too. So you, you um, did this book, you put it out there. Um, you'd mentioned, I, I actually wanted to go back to this cause you'd mentioned uh, you put it out and then you're like, Oh, what should I do with this? Like, was there a sort of, pre-launch sort of method that you went through? Did you have a pre-launch plan or anything? Yes. You did. Okay. So some of it got thrown out of the window because um, of things got, everything got slowed down at the publisher because of shortages oh, yeah. and stuff. Yeah. But I had like a list of podcasts to email, I had a list of, um, so I did like a couple podcasty things. I, I emailed every journal who has every, ever published a poem of mine and was like, hey, can you tweet about my book? Mm -hmm. Um, And every single one said yes. Oh, Um, cool. Poetry journals, they're great. Yeah. Um, And poetry is such a small industry. um, There's no money in it. So it's not like you hire a publicist. There are no publicists for poetry. But I read a book about publicizing your book. Um, So I just, a lot of it was just cold emails. Um, Was just like, I emailed like my high school newspaper. (laughs) And I was like, hey, kids, (laughs) I have a book out. That's actually Um, pretty ingenious. Okay. Just like little bits, anyone who might even care about me even a little, mm-hmm. I reached out to. Um, I didn't hear back at all from most like most newspapers or anything, um, probably because nobody reads poetry. Yeah. Um, but then with I did, a, I did like an online event. I'm doing a launch in March, COVID permitting. Um, and then just emailing oh postcards so i printed a couple hundred postcards with my book cover on it and i send them to everyone i know Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's funny because you think you're posting on facebook all the time or twitter all the time you think everyone in your life knows about your book right and then you start getting like 30 texts that are like i didn't know you had a book coming out just got your postcard in the mail Uh, yeah it's one of those things where you're just like oh do people really want to hear about this again and then you find out like nobody heard about it to begin with yeah it is uh, I do that. that all the time. <laughs> I'm always um, like, so, I didn't tell anybody. Yeah. I feel like I learned that a lot during this process, especially through the postcard bit. So like I tried to, around the date, I tried to post some pictures that would, on Facebook, that would garner the word congratulations because those always get bumped up. Yeah. So like the days the book, the day the book came in the mail and like my, I opened like my comps box. Um, and then like, even in these posts, after posting almost like every other day for like months, there are people like, didn't know you had a book out just Mm pre-ordered and I'm like even still like and then the day of like I did a little cake picture um with a candle in it just like birthday for the book (laughs) um just trying to like gain some traction online just to remind people like again like poetry I feel like people people will buy it they know your work they'll buy it they like the cover or if they're in a store and they flip through it but like a lot of it is just remembering the people and reminding the people in your life that like this exists. And like, I'm not like pushing it on anyone. I'm not, I'm not following up saying, did you buy my book? I'm just letting people know, here's a book. If you want to buy it, buy it. And people were really responsive and nice about it. Yeah. And you did an online reading recently too, yes. uh, just this past week. So how did, how did you set up this online reading? <clears throat> Um, I just reached out to a bunch of people, all okay. cold emails again. Just like, like this was your own. You weren't doing it for any organization. This was your own online reading. Uh, so it was, it's an, it's a group called Port Veritas and they're in Maine, Portland, Maine, I think. And okay. they do this monthly or every other week or something. Oh, okay. All right. And so they have like an open mic and then a featured reader. So they had me on as their featured reader, <clears throat> which okay. was fun. Um, and it was, it was nice. Um, and it was really cool to see like friends and family come out and support my book. Um, again, like uh, some of my friends have read my poetry because a lot of my friends are poets, yeah. but none of my family has read my poetry. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, they're just like, oh, this is interesting. I think 
cold emails is just the thing that I learned. Just email everyone, let everyone know. Um, I emailed all the schools I've ever been to, their libraries. Oh, yeah. Library, will you carry my book? I went to your school. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And I think I was actually prepped because I was in like three Kickstarters this year. Oh, you were? (laughs) And just, yeah. um, And just learning from the people who know what they're doing. Yeah. (laughs) And just like, oh, like this is what they're doing. They're... Um, there was one by visibility. So it was like a, it was all bisexual writers, I think, doing stories related to bisexuality. Okay. And uh, the person who who ran it, Kat, I believe their name is, um, like sent us all these form emails to send to local comic book stores. Okay. To get them to say, hey, here's a new book out. I'm a local. Um, We, they have a retailer package. Do you want to support this book for retail? Okay. And, like just realizing, oh yeah, that is kind of just how you get your books into stores. It's just telling people because they don't know it exists unless they're chronically online, like right. we, like I am. Um, but they're busier than me, right? Um, yeah. They have things to do. They have a comic book store to run. So yeah, just doing stuff like that where it's just like, oh, it's it's so much like work. Like it's just it feels like, and it's funny. My mom um, and my dad, when they were younger, they sold encyclopedias door to door. Okay. So it's lit. It feels like that. Obviously, it's not. I didn't that, know people actually did that. I always thought that was oh, just yeah. a thing they said on TV. <laughs> no, in the eighties they did that, and it's shocking how like they sold. My mom says they sold one out of four. So okay. like out of four doors that they knocked on, they sold one set, and like those sets were like a grand in the eighties. Wow, that's actually like, a really that good turnaround. Yeah. Like that, is, like just showing up to someone's door and saying, "Will you spend a thousand nineteen eighties dollars on books?" Um, but it was the age of no internet, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that that's how you got information. I mean, we had them, but I think we got them through a deal at the grocery store or something like that. But oh. I know we had them. Huh. There you go. <laughs> yeah, was, um, weird. I, but, you just made me think about encyclopedias. Just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it does feel like you're just knocking on a hundred doors, hoping that someone opens their door and says, yeah, sure. Oh, wow. You really are a writer. That was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> And what about the, uh, you do a monthly email list as well. Yeah. How do you, how do you find people for that? How do you, how do you get people to sign up? Is it, is it just on your site or you do it in other methods? So like I plug, it's in my bio. So I plug it every time I publish something. Yeah. Hopefully if people care enough to scroll down to my bio again, when I started it, I emailed everyone I knew. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I wasn't pushing anything. I was just like, Hey, just want to let you know, I have this thing. Um, if you want to sign up for it, let me know. I'll put your email on the thing. And I must have sent maybe 400 emails, Um, like not just to friends and family, but like to mentors, to people I used to work with. And like some people do want to keep up with what you're publishing. Um, And I, for my newsletter, it's not just what I've been publishing. I do an original, like a a short essay in every newsletter. So it's always a piece of cultural criticism. So um, it'll be about... um, SpongeBob SquarePants, the musical, or E.B. White's essays, or this cool comic book I read, or this movie that I loved, or this movie I hated. Yeah. Um, and so it'll always be something like that. And so I feel like I'm providing something hopefully thoughtful and short. They're usually only about 500 words. Um, and I realized, like, I, I started it two years ago, which is wild, having done it every month for two years. But it really, really, I feel like, meant a lot during the beginning of the pandemic. Mm. Um, like I always ask people to email back and usually there's like one or two people. Mm -hmm. Um, but like at the beginning of the pandemic, it was like 20, 30 people each time I sent it out. And there were, cause like I was writing pretty emotionally about like my feelings about the pandemic and like whatever I was reading or listening to and people were responding similarly. They were just like, I feel like this and what you said Hmm. made me feel this. And I don't know what's going to happen next, which is kind of how we all were in March april may of 2020 yeah um and it i think it really kind of moved me because it reminded me um that because especially writing online i feel like i know people are reading it (laughs) or else people wouldn't publish it (laughs) right people wouldn't pay me for the thing if like no one's reading it but it doesn't feel like anyone's reading it i don't get a whole lot of comments usually Mm -hmm. some of the places i write don't even have a place for comments so unless someone takes their time out of their day to send me an email which sometimes people do and it's very nice i always appreciate it um it's it feels like you're writing into the void (laughs) 
And so like having that moment of just being like, oh, I'm not writing into the void. People are reading this and it's having an impact on their lives. Even like if, and I don't mean like I'm changing their lives. I mean, like for 15 minutes, they sat and they read this and they felt a certain way. Like Mm -hmm. that's all I ever want. Like I don't need to, like I have no grand (laughs) ideas about my work. Like I'm not like a genius or anything. I want to have people's attention from the beginning to the end Mm -hmm. and make them feel something, right? That's my goal. And like, I feel like the newsletter has really helped me with that. And and a back to the notes thing. That's something I try to do too. Anytime I hear something or read something that I like, um, I try to send a note if I can. Oh. Um, just saying, hey, I really appreciated this. Throw in a detail. And then, like, it made me feel like this. Um, because whenever I get them, they, like, make my day. Like, yeah. I keep them all in a little folder of, like, <laughs> when you feel like crap, read this. Um, but it is really, like... And if that works for me, like maybe it'll work for and the person who wrote the comic that I just read, mm-hmm. right? So like things like that, especially like overlooked artists. Like um, I, when I was in New York, I went to see shows a lot. I'm a big Broadway fan and like set designers, lighting people, mm-hmm. um, like costume designers. Like these are all people who like are so instrumental <laughs> to the process, but like usually don't get fan mail. <laughs> Yeah. So it's like, oh, I think almost every set designer I ever emailed, like emailed back and oh, said, really? oh my God, thank you. Shared this with the whole team. And it's like, they, it's like they put their hearts and souls into these huge productions. And like, they, they, pro- they probably get like one, two letters, like, mm-hmm. like compared to like a hundred of like the main actor's letters. Right. So, so I always try to do that just, it also helps me like understand the work, but it helps me pay more attention. I think. Yeah. Cause then it's not just like, I think you see this a lot when you're watching movies with someone who doesn't care about the details. <laughs> <laughs> like my mother, she'll watch a movie and at the end she'll be like, it's pretty good. Or I didn't like it. And that's like the end. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, well, what did you think about the use of sound in like the first 10 minutes? Right. <laughs> and I feel like, as a cultural critic, obviously that's part of like what I do, but to me, it makes my life more interesting. It makes interacting with a work of art more interesting. Like I'm not, nit- I'm not trying to nitpick. I'm not saying this is all terrible. Like I feel like really paying attention to what's actually happening um, contributes to a much deeper understanding of the art that I'm interacting with. Yeah. Knowing, uh, yeah, especially for someone who does so many different aspects of art creation and process, you, you understand that they all go together. It's kind of like in the beginning when I said, I'm jealous of the fact that you can write because that's the most difficult part of anything I have to do. Even when I post this podcast, mm-hmm. it's going to be like me writing the paragraph of like what's going on in this podcast. I'm already dreading because I'm, it's like even just that paragraph. And you're saying like, and it's only 500 words when you write your essay. <laughs> And well, I'm like, funny. only 500 words. That's like, it's only $100. Um. <laughs> writing anxiety is super, it's like, so I actually teach writing to undergraduate students. Um, I teach them technical writing. So I'm teaching computer science students okay. writing, which is like, it's like students who don't write normally. Yeah. Um, It's very different from teaching like English students writing, right? And like the big thing with, again, I feel like it's too, it's always too, angles that people get caught on. One of them is they feel like whatever they're writing has to be encompassing of everything. Yes. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Like this has to explain, like what you were just saying with the, with the little bit of writing that goes with the podcast, this has to explain the whole podcast. Right. That is a fallacy, right? It doesn't have to explain the whole podcast. It It's just there to do a job. Right. And the job is just to get people to know more or less what's going to be discussed Mm -hmm. so to make the job smaller i think is always important so like i'll have students who are working on their papers and they'll be like well how do i explain how tesla's auto driving function works and i'm (laughs) like you're not doing that (laughs) in in two pages that's not happening like you want to just get the main concepts right you just and so that's the first angle that i think people get stuck on and the other one is like built up fear Mm -hmm. like the longer you put something off the worse it always gets Mm -hmm. um i do this all the time with emails i'm like i don't want to answer that email Mm -hmm. and i'll wait all day to answer it and it'll take me like two minutes and i'll be like i spent the whole day feeling crappy about this email 
It's like but you're like, stealing my thoughts, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's so common. And I had it too when I started. Okay. And I think what you were saying about journaling is really important and, and having a diary is you have to do it constantly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you probably, I mean, it's the same with art, right? I'm yeah. sure when you started out, it was so scary to do anything. Oh, yeah. That's literally um, the reason then, I started the webcomic was so that I exactly. would draw and I knew it was going to be bad and I wouldn't like it. Yeah. There you go. Mm-hmm. But once you do it a hundred times, it's no big deal. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's, it's, what do you call it? Like when they, when you're scared of spiders, then they like uh, exposure therapy. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, it's exposure therapy, but like for writing. <laughs> like so that I you compare it to scared of spiders. Every, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm terrified of spiders. Yeah. I think um, a lot of people are. <laughs> but, but like just doing exposure therapy on yourself with writing and just once you've done it a hundred times, it can't be scary anymore yeah. because you've already done it. Like, you know, you've done it. Yeah, no, and and you're right. And it's one of those things where it's like, I just got to do it. It's kind of like quitting smoking. It's like, I know it's bad and I should quit one of these days. So I will eventually, you know, one of those things where, and then eventually you do. And then it's like, why did it take me so long to accomplish this? You know, uh, I feel the same way though. Like even with my writing now, like all, if I get stuck and it happens very rarely, um, but it happens. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, and all of a sudden it's like, I don't know what I'm doing. And then it just gets worse because you spiral. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think now I've been doing it enough years that I realize you just have to work through it. Even if your writing is awful, you can't just not write because if you not if you don't write, you're never going to get out of it. You're just going to be stuck right. in the slump forever. You just have to work through. I, I, the same thing happens with art. Sometimes I'll just be doing a bunch of bad art. And you can't just, you just have to make a lot of bad art until it starts getting good again. Well, I particularly like your art. And apparently I have a hard work, a hard time saying particularly. There we go. Now I said it <laughs> properly. Um, and uh, it also, do you have any other projects or things that are coming? I know you just released a book. and yes. <laughs> you know, But is there anything else that like you're working on or things that you uh, have coming up <clears throat> or, or projects that you want to do that you'd like to mention to people? Um. That is a good question. Thank um, you. <laughs> I, I do have the book out, A List of Things I've Lost, which you can order on Amazon and barnesandnoble.com or whatever. Yeah. I have my monthly newsletter and the diary comic on Instagram. What's coming up? Just regular. Oh, um, 2000 AD is publishing their best of um, like graphic novels. I'm going to have an essay in one of those. Okay. Um, so that'll be coming out in the spring, I think. Um, and yeah, I think just little comics projects are going to pop up here and there, um, with me writing, like just the script, not, not drawing. Um, Oh really? Yeah. Like I've had a couple out this year through Kickstarters. Um, and I had, I did, um, a pilot three episodes for a web comic for pocket comics. Um, but they ended up deciding they weren't going to do, um, original comics anymore. So that was mm-hmm. a bummer. That's too bad. Um, but, but yeah, I, I, I like writing comics and I'd like to do more of it. What genre um, of comics are you going to be writing? Um, mostly horror. Oh, um, really? Horror or like supernatural, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Oh, fun. Um, it's, I find it really fun. Yeah. Um, I really love the genre. Um, I, and actually any genre, like it sounds silly, but horror and romance <laughs> and like sci-fi, not in all mixed together, but like in their own little corners, mm-hmm. um, to me, they're like the most fun way of telling a story because the building blocks are there. You just get to play with them, right? Yeah. Um, so so hopefully I'll have some more comics out this upcoming year. Not quite sure what, where they're going to be yet or when the ones that I am sure they're going to be are going to be <laughs> announced. But, you know, keep eyes open and hopefully there will be stuff to okay. see. <laughs> and for uh, information on you and also where they could get your book and your comic, where should people go to? Yes. Um, so my website is tiffanybab.com and Bab is B-A-B-B. It's an Irish name. Oh. Um, my father, his family is from Mexico, but there were Irish colonizers at some point, apparently. Okay. Um, and on Twitter and on Instagram, I met Exploding Arrow and my Exploding Arrow is probably the best way to keep up with my diary comic. It's also on Tapas um, and gets posted on Reddit. Um, and then my newsletter is tiffanybab.com slash newsletter. So pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, the book is called a list of things I've lost and you can order it pretty much anywhere books are sold. 
which is exciting. And places now. <laughs> yeah, places, <laughs> uh, physical that. places. I'm going to go look at one today and take a picture of it. That's so cool. All right. That's well, true. I want to thank you so much for talking with me today. I'm glad we thank were able you. to this have a really conversation. Fun. 